Good morning. Let's go ahead and take our hymnals and turn to hymn number 323. 323. He ransomed me. No, he leaning on the everlasting arm. 323. Welcome to you this morning. Good. 323. Go ahead, please. I think we sang it last night, we'll sing it again this morning. All right. Good morning. Uh, the subject that I'm going to be speaking on is a little boring, so you're going to have to put up with me for a while. It uh, involves uh, people behind the scenes who are eventually going to translate the Bible into our 1611 King James Bible. But uh, the, as you will see, there's a lot of politics and internal bickering uh, going on, and it's important to understand this because uh, later on I want to discuss... Uh, today's situation a little bit. So while traveling south from Scotland in 1603, James, the new king of England, was met by a Puritan delegation and presented with a millinery petition signed by a thousand ministers of the Church of England. The Puritans were encouraged by the belief that James' views were similar to their own beliefs and that he would be sympathetic to their proposals. James, however, had written earlier that he considered the Puritans as pests. Uh, the demands of the Puritans presented to James in the petition was for the abolishment of mostly ritualistic daily practices, such as making the sign of the cross in baptism and clerical dress. Uh, we know that from uh, the, uh, the times of Jesus, uh, he had to face uh, people in his own day uh, who were like that, who were bent on the formalities of things. Uh, the king also decided to end what the Puritans called inappropriate tithes, a long-standing means of funding the bishops in the Church of England. At a meeting with the king, the bishops persuaded the king to abandon this idea. It was uh, becoming apparent quickly that the changes were happening quickly. This new king was determined to be very active in the religious life of England. 
This raised tensions between the Church of England and the Puritans. There were already conflicts between them, but it seemed that James presented uncertain possibilities for both sides. Richard Bancroft, uh, the Bishop of London and future Archbishop of Canterbury, was determined to continue to accuse the Puritans as false prophets, threatening to destroy the balance of the church and nation. When it was announced that James VI was to succeed Elizabeth, Bancroft became anguished. He had heard about James and knew about his reputation. He was afraid the new king would convert England to Presbyterianism and abolish the Church of England, thus eliminating his position. Though Bancroft seemed to be thinking and planning for his own good, he was also thinking of how he truly felt about the Church. He wasn't entirely selfish, but ambitions often dominate in the hearts of good people, even now. Bancroft was keenly aware of James's view of the importance of kingship. James considered uh, the throne to be divinely ordained institution. Bancroft decided that he needed to persuade James that the episcopacy was vital to the support of his kingdom and that the Puritans and Catholics did not share that feeling. So Bancroft recognized his opportunity. More bishops became involved in the convincing of King, uh, uh, the king their loyalty. Lancelot Andrews, a key translator of the King James Bible, also worked to support the views of the other bishops. James was receptive to the support of the bishops, but he also wanted to hear all the problems of the Puritans as well. He wanted to resolve the tensions between the bishops and the Puritans, and soon he found out that these tensions were far worse than he had realized. On January 14, 1604, the Hampton Court Conference was convened. King James made it clear to both groups, the bishops and the Puritans, that he would have a decisive role in the affairs of the church, establishing doctrine and policy. James said there were, would be no radical revision of the stability Elizabeth had achieved, but he wished to confirm what he felt settled already. This conference was clearly dominated by a reform agenda, and James was clearly up to the task. So far, no mention is made of any proposal for a new translation of the Bible. On the second day of the conference, the prominent speakers for the Puritans John Reynolds uh, stated four demands. One, that the doctrine of the church might be preserved in purity uh, according to God's word. Second, the good pastors might be planted in all churches to preach the same. Three, that the church government might be sincerely administered according to God's word. And four, that the book of common prayer might be fitted to more increase of piety. At this point, there was no interest among the Puritans for a new English translation. In fact, they had hopes the Geneva Bible would become the authorized, uh, would become authorized for use in the churches and public life, which was against the wishes of the Church of England. They preferred the Bishop's Bible. James didn't want to accept the Puritan uh, demands because he wanted to keep the peace. He didn't want a new period of religious infighting when he was trying to foster a sense of unity. History has proven the controversies of the past to be painful, resulting in apostasy. James was not at all enthusiastic about authorizing the Geneva Bible. He knew it from his time in Scotland since it was such a popular translation in the Protestant churches. Uh, he also considered it the worst of all English versions. Uh, that was uh, because of uh, uh, the notes, the study notes that are in the Bible from Calvin uh, and Knox, and uh, he didn't like any of that. It was absolutely unthinkable to authorize the Geneva Bible for use in the church. 
It seems there is nothing he could do to please all. Anything he could do for the Puritans would alienate the bishops, leaving things as they are would anger the Puritans and please the bishops. Clearly, a gesture was needed to heal some of the wounds between these two factions. Unless the conference was to be perceived as one-sided, a breakthrough was struck when John Reynolds, a leader among the Puritans, proposed a new Bible translation. It's not clear where this idea came from or its motivation, but those who would soon become members of the translation committees were keenly aware of all the latest editions of the Greek text by Theodore Beza as well as those of Stephanus and Erasmus. The men who would participate in the new translation were all scholars who knew the biblical languages as well as they knew English. The bishops and the Puritans were both receptive to the uh, uh, commission of the new Bible. They were all aware of the shortcomings of the Bishop Bible and uh, the Geneva Bible. The Roman Catholic Church had published a New Testament in English in 1582, a translation by Gregory Martin. It was not translated from the Greek, but that of the Latin Vulcan. An Old Testament translation would follow later. This Catholic translation, the Dewey Reims, was produced by the Council of Trent, which established the teachings of the Counter-Reformation, the definitive response to the Protestant Reformation. Gregory Martin said that uh, the translators of the Geneva Bible deliberately altered Scripture in order to make Protestant doctrine conform to their Bible. Blatant dishonesty. Uh, I think we get that from uh, the Catholic position today. <laughs> uh, certainly not saved by works. Uh, the Dewey Reims uh, Bible would now pose a threat to the Bishop's Bible and the Geneva Bible. The Anglicans and the Puritans shared a profound dislike for Roman Catholicism, so this problem uh, was now a challenge to be met. James thus directed uh, the best learned from Cambridge and Oxford to begin work on a new translation of the Bible. The best learned are well known today, not just because of their Bible translation, but their su superior expertise in language and their dedication to the task of the Bible. Some have claimed that the translators were actually inspired of God with revelation beyond what is actually in the Greek texts. This, uh, the translator never uh, made such a claim. Obviously, it was uh, the providence of God that brought these men together and guided them in their work. But God didn't tell them what to write word for word. God inspired the original writers uh, of the Bible Hmm, that's a, something I wrote wrong. God did not inspire the original writers of the Bible. Oh, I'm sorry. He did inspire the original writers of the Bible by giving them each and every word. Uh, that was the inspiration. We just need to examine Scripture closely. Second uh, Peter 1, verse 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but by holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost scholarship and guidance from uh, from God gave us the King James Bible uh, translators the providence of God caused the need for these new translate for the new translation and brought these men together when the Lord knew the time was right we have a Bible we can trust many pastors pre uh, preach directly from the King James Bible and often explain Greek words uh, to clarify the meaning of Scripture. Uh, they do this because uh, even though our Bible is great and we can rely on it, every word of that Bible, they have to clarify a little bit more and that needs to be found in the Greek. Um, it's important to be aware of the quality of our Bible. The original language text 
the translators, the theology, and the technique of translation did not occur with any modern translation. So we have a very special and precious Bible in our hands. Throughout history, there have been many people who have tried to cast doubt on the Bible by trying to change the meaning of Scripture by saying the words are symbolic or there are errors suggesting that in making copies, mistakes were introduced. But how could this be? In comparing Scripture with Scripture, we find clarity and truth. For example, in 2 Samuel 21.19, Elhanan slew the brother of Goliath. The modern versions uh, say that he slew Goliath. And then uh, earlier... Uh, we read that uh, David slew Goliath. Uh, and yet, we don't hear that mentioned very often. There are plenty of mistakes in uh, the modern uh, versions of the Bible. As The more we look at the King James Bible, the more we, we realize that it really is a, a very special book. This comes down to the simple fact that we have a Bible in the King James Version that is complete, accurate, historically correct, and read, uh, liter and we read it literally, is reliable for our spiritual growth. We are confronted every day with confusion. Churches that accept homosexuality, abortion, worldwide socialism, uh, worldliness uh, that dominates the hearts of its members, except on Sundays. Uh, the language of modern versions is more relaxed and doesn't draw the kind of reverence we naturally feel when reading the King James Bible. Uh, these newer versions are not so accusatory uh, as our King James Bible. When we read that, we realize, yes, we are sinners. Uh, we are not perfect. Uh, we can't make ourselves uh, perfect. Uh, we cannot find our way to heaven. We need God's grace, and that comes only through Jesus Christ. I hope that everyone here will continue to read the KJV and keep in mind the reasons why it is preferred. We should also remember to make sure that our friends in church also understand why we use the KJV and that they can also tell others. This is important because young pastors are coming out of the seminaries, as we heard about yesterday, in modernizing churches with CCM, modern Bible versions, and liberalism. Uh, liberalism in uh, our society, as well as the liberalism in politics, is basically the same thing. We're not uh, being discriminating uh, when we become liberalists. Barack Obama has said the world is very peaceful today. Uh, <laughs> with all of these killings uh, from all of uh, uh, these terrorists uh, that have reached France and the United States and uh, other countries, Germany has had a few of them, uh, and all of uh, the brutal fighting among uh, Muslims and themselves in the Middle East, uh, especially in Syria, uh, it's very clear that we do not have peace in this world. And how Barack Obama can go on television and say that we have so much peace. And I wonder how many people are listening to it and believing it and not remembering what they heard 30 minutes earlier on the news about the violence in the world. We have to be the same way. We have to wake up and see the differences uh, within our churches. Uh, within uh, the, uh, the people who preach to us on television and I uh, wish they weren't there but uh, we need to take control of our own lives and understand uh, things that are true all that is true in the world is in the King James Bible we're not going to find any truth on television or in the movies uh, or anywhere in society the only truth uh, that we can encounter is in the Bible. We need to study it. Every year I get on the phone and call churches and people all around the country to tell them about the um, upcoming Dean Bergon meeting. I do this uh, throughout May and June. Every year I still talk uh, to new pastors who have recently come to their new church 
as head pastors, some replacing uh, King James Bible with a new version like the NASB or the ESV or the New King James Bible. Some of these new pastors are strong on traditional King James Bible, and I'm really glad to hear that. Sometimes I talk to uh, the church secretary and I try to let them know uh, that these DBS meetings aren't just for pastors, they're for everyone. Everyone in the church, uh, they need to be aware of this. Either come here or if they can't travel, something prevents them from doing this. Listen to it on the internet. We're streaming live right now. All throughout the whole month of August uh, on the BibleForToday.org or the Dean Bergon Society.org, 24 hours a day for the whole month, these messages are going to be there. Uh, if you know somebody at home uh, who is interested uh, but has not had the chance to come to the Dean Bergon meeting, let them know about it. Most of our pastors work hard to make sure their people understand the importance of using the King James Bible. We as church members should feel obligated to help them by assisting new members and people we encounter outside of the church about our Bible. Many people, even in other churches, don't even think there is anything important about one version or another. We had an uh, interim pastor uh, in this particular church before Pastor Spencer came. Uh, I came visiting uh, at that time because I was looking for a church and uh, uh, I hadn't been to church since I was a little kid. But I asked that pastor uh, what he preferred uh, in terms of a Bible. I still had uh, my uh, King James Bible from when I was a little kid. Uh, I got it in uh, 1956 and it's been on the shelf ever since. So I asked him about it, and he says, oh, it doesn't matter what Bible you use. You can use any Bible. And I knew he wasn't right. I was very glad when Pastor Spencer came. <laughs> he straightened out this church. Uh, this year I called a church. I don't remember what state he was in. And the pastor told me that all the other churches within a 50-mile radius, radius uses modern versions. The pastor said he is frustrated because there's no fellowship with any nearby churches because of the different Bibles. Still, this man was positive and had a great personality. I told him that if he uh, can't come to the meeting, he can view all the messages on the Internet. Uh, I hope he does uh, because it would at least... Uh, uh, give him an opportunity to find out resources uh, that would support him. Uh, he'd find messages that he could share uh, with people in his church other than the messages that he's giving as well. Some people would not understand this because having words in English that correspond to the actual words the Lord gave us in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek is not as important to them as it is for us. Uh, one of the reasons why I go to the Bible for today, Baptist Church, is uh, I prayed uh, because I wanted the truth. I didn't want to be entertained with a, a nice pipe organ, uh, or I didn't want to hear a fancy choir, or uh, some of the churches even have orchestras. Uh, I wasn't interested in any of that. The only thing that I want is actual truth. I want to learn to understand the Bible, and I want to understand uh, what it means to be a Christian. And uh, I want to uh, learn to do everything that I can do uh, to become a better Christian. And it's a long process for me because I uh, come from a background uh, that is very, very sinful. Uh, and I've had to make a lot of changes in my life, and I still have a few more. But the nice thing is, by reading the Bible and by talking with other people uh, in church, uh, I don't have to break a habit. Uh, habits change of themselves. I don't know how, but they do. They, they just do. Uh, I was able to give up the beer, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't miss it at all. Uh, I smoked from the time I was 10 years old. Uh, up till about uh, 
ten years ago, and I had a, a, a lot of tobacco in my lungs, and I'm paying the price for that today, uh, as I have uh, some breathing problems. But uh, I had tried years ago uh, to quit, and I couldn't do it. But I figured, well, either I'm going to be a slave to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, or I'm going to be a slave to that cigarette. That's not much of a contest between the two. So I made my choice. Uh, I prefer to be a slave to Jesus Christ, as Paul would call himself uh, a slave uh, to the Lord. And uh, that's my message. <laughs> Thank you very much. Don't clap for me. You didn't clap for anybody else yesterday. <laughs> and they deserved it. Pastor Rainey gave a really fine message. <laughs> And so did Dr. DeVitro. In fact, Dr. DeVitro gave us some literature, which was going to be handy. Yes. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, Psalms 119, verses... Pardon me? All stand up. Have more stand up. Have more stand up. Have more stand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you... I'm a little slow this morning. Uh, would you please stand for the reading of Scripture? This is Psalm 119, verses 49 through 56. Remember the word unto thy servant, upon which thou hast caused me to, to hope. This is my comfort, my affliction, for the word hath quickened me. For the proud have had me greatly in derision, yet have I not declined from thy law. I remember thy judgment, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that force of thy law. The statutes have been my songs. In the house of my pilgrimage, I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the might and have kept the law. This I had because I kept thy precepts. Thank you. You may see. Can be seated. That's fine. Thank you, Bill. Bill is one of our executive uh, advisory council members. Uh, Let's uh, sing the hymn. We'll stand. We'll just we keep seated. That's fine. Number 268 in the garden. 268. We can be seated. That's fine. We can be seated. That's good. All right. 268. Questions and answer time. So let's get our questions that you might have before us. Before we have the questions, those that came in after we announced that our new didn't come in yesterday, but our new today, uh, stand and give us your name and where you're from, please. West Mount, New Jersey. Any others? That came? Yes, sir, back there. New York, all the way from New York. Any others that came in that weren't here earlier? I read Trish. Okay, Trish is the way. All right. All right, we have some questions and answer time. Yes, right there. Fine. All right. Anyone heard from Bill that just spoke when he called on the telephone 
anybody here that talked to him on the phone and came because of it? Came because of it. Anybody that heard him and came? I guess nobody came, Bill, but at least maybe they're listening on the Internet. <laughs> All right. Do you have some questions that we might be able to have? At this time, we have a few minutes. Well, let me ask you a few questions. For number one, what is the Gnostic Greek text? So I'm going to give us some answers. Right. Stand in the microphone and tell us about the Gnostic Greek text. Anybody, come on. Executive Committee, Advisor Council. If you don't have questions, I'm going to ask you some questions. We've got some time here. We're not going to waste it. Go ahead. Dr. DeVitro. Vice President. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Vitro. Other questions on your part? Yes, sir. Go right to the microphone, if you would, please. Yeah. One of your brethren going to answer that question. Advisory Council, can you say, yes, Bob? No, no, he's talking about eight, those who read the Bible, read the King James Bible. That's what he's talking about. Anybody have that answer? I think someone mentioned that uh, general uh, idea that more people are reading the King James who read the Bible than other Bibles. I, I heard that. I'm not sure if positively, but I, I heard that. What well, other questions? Oh, I want to answer that. What's the most, number one selling Bible today? Get up to the mic, yeah, come to the microphone and ask that if you could. Come to the microphone so people can hear it on the internet also. Um, just wanted to know what the number one selling Bible is. I heard that for the last two years it was the King James Bible. I was wondering if anybody else has, knows that answer. All right, Dr. Vitro, Vice President. Usually when we get the statistics like we got yesterday that it was the third, that's because they pull the major publishers. When you put in the private churches that are publishing King James Bible and put in the very precious seat, it is still the number one selling book in the world. But, but again, the major publishers, that's all they count when they sell the second or whatever. So it, it, I don't have numbers to give you, but it's still the number one selling book. And I think also in addition to that, the statistics many times, they include the NIV, for instance, New Testaments. Not the whole Bible, see? So, the New Testament, so that adds up. So that's absolutely correct. Other questions? Yes, sir. Come right up here, Brother Ed, to the microphone and ask your question. Brother Dr. Ed Smith. One of the uh, easiest things in the New Testament to know if we had a critical text, translation, or a received text would be Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20 could be missing. How would I know if I had a, a translation from the Old Testament from the Ben Asher or the Ben Kaim? How would I be able to tell that easily? Okay. 
Just let me just get this. Just hold on just a minute. All right, speak up a little louder. This man has a question on the telephone. Go ahead. Yes, I'm from Virginia, and we're studying Joshua in our church. And some of the commentaries mentioned the JEDP, or Documentary Hypothesis. Could you explain how to counter that? Okay, the JEPT. Documentary Hypothesis. Question. Who's got the answer? Any of you, brethren? Dr. Vitro, go ahead. If you got it. Or Pastor Dan. Come on, Pastor Dan. You give it first, and Dr. Vitro second. Go ahead. Both of these are vice presidents of the DBS, and both have the answers. Go right ahead. Uh, the, the best way to counter it is Jesus said Moses wrote the Pentateuch. He's the one who said he wrote the law. Yes. And if Jesus said it, that's good enough for me. If Genesis chapters 1 through 3 are not literal and accurate, the rest of the Bible means nothing. Because Jesus died for the sons of Adam who had become sinners. And if, if, if Adam is not literal and he's not real, then all the rest of the Bible is a myth. It's a point of faith. There's no question about it. But Jesus said that Moses wrote it, and, and that's good enough for me. After that. That, you sure? All right. Other, yes, sir. Come on here. We got Dr. Brother Grumbride, one of our advisory council members. Oh, 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 yeah, what was the question again? I'm sorry. Yeah, Dr. Esmond, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm very sorry about that. Go ahead, Brother Ed. I was uh, asking a question. Um, when you're looking at the translation from a critical text or mm -hmm. from the received text, in Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, so it's omitted in the critical text. Mm -hmm. How would I be able to look at a translation in the Old Testament and know if I was looking at something that was translated from the Ben Kaim versus the Ben Asher? All right, that's a good question. Brethren, who got the answers for that one? Ben Kaim, which is the proper Hebrew text, Ben Asher, the wrong Hebrew text. Dr. Demetrio. There, there's a couple of verses. One is the book, verse of Job, though he slay me, yet will I serve him or trust him. Uh, they changed that one, but what's the one in Isaiah they changed? Uh, not. That word well, not. The, the, their joy shall not be increased. Yes. Becomes their joy. What is that verse? Uh, something. Not increase the nation. And not increase the joy. And not increase the joy in the King James Bible. They take away a tittle, and it becomes and increase the joy. It turns it around, but I don't remember the exact reference. Yes. Isaiah 9. Okay, but but they the actual Hebrew text between Ben Kaim and Ben Asher are not that different. I studied through Isaiah, I went through Jeremiah, Dead, Deuteronomy, went through. The difference is in the stupid notes that they're using. They are not translating from either one when they're bringing in these new translations. They're coming from the Masoretic notes around the outside. Not the actual Hebrew text. You're bringing in the Dead Sea Scroll or the Septuagint, Samaritan Pentateuch, and they're not they're not changing the text that much. I, I couldn't discover more than one or two tiny tiny changes. But when they change the Old Testament, they're coming in from these other sources without changing the Hebrew text, and so it's hard to catch them. Regarding the difference between the Ben Kaim text, the good Hebrew text, and the Ben Asher. Uh, several years back, Mr. Wade and I went over to England. We visited the Trinitarian Bible Society, and generally they're a general good uh, people. And we asked one of the people, the ladies that was using the Hebrew text, were there many, many differences? And she said, oh, maybe 10, 15 differences. I've tried to get the exact differences for many years, many decades, between the Ben Kaim and the Ben Asher Hebrew text. Some man tried it, and then they stopped in the middle. But my feeling is they're wrong. TBS, Trinitarian Bible Society, is dead wrong saying just five or ten. If it's only five or ten, why did they change the Hebrew text uh, in the year 19, whatever it was? They changed uh, first, the first text that they had uh, under, what is his name, the first guy? Under Kittle, the Kittle text uh, was the proper text originally. Then all of a sudden they changed it in 1937. Why did they change from the one text to the other? 
unless there are tremendous, gigantic changes, and that's what they did. So, anyhow, I believe that's right. So there's tremendous differences. We'd like to have some scholar who wants to compare and see what the exactly total differences, but they've started, but they quit. We don't really know. All we know is there's plenty of differences. Now, this question, right ahead. Sorry about that. I just wanted to comment on what is the most popular Bible printed or published today. And many people may not know this, but the King James Bible is copyrighted in England, and only the King's Press and anywhere else that England allows to publish it can publish it in England. But the copyright is not there in the rest of the known world. Right. Because of that, anybody can print or put on the Internet the content of the King James Bible. So many times those go forth and they're not counted amongst those that are sold or published. So the King James Bible is still the most popularly written and published and put forth Bible in the world. All right, thank you, Brother Grumbach. Yes, sir, back there, question. There's only three more minutes, so make a brief, please. I want to know about uh, the Septuagint. Uh, did the disciples quote from it? Uh, I know the Septuagint I heard was... Well, oh, did the problems. disciples quote from the Septuagint A.D.? Well, brethren, who's got that question? Answer. Well, Dr. Dr. Vitri, you're close there. To the microphone, go ahead with it. A couple of years ago, I did a study on that because I heard the same thing. I looked at every Old Testament quote in John, in Acts, and in Hebrews, which they said were the most quoted. I did not find one single quote that was directly from the Septuagint. In fact, in, in doing Moore's research, I'm convinced the Septuagint as a body did not exist until Origins, fifth column, and the Hexapla. Uh, there were Greek uh, targums, unofficial paraphrases. The Hebrews do not accept anything but the Hebrew as the Word of God. Uh, I think the main reason they say that they quoted the Septuagint is because they substituted the word Lord wherever the, the divine name appeared in the Old Testament. But, but I could not find a single one in last year. What's his name? Floyd Nolan Jones? Yeah, Jones. Huh? Was at the meeting, and he took the concordances out of the major libraries, checked every single reference, and he could not find one single direct quote before eight days. So I, I don't believe it was used. So as far as the date of the Septuagint, the apostates, the liberals, the fundamentalists, the new evangelicals, all they say is B.C., well, until I see the whole Septuagint in Greek B.C., I will believe it. Now, there are a few books in Greek B.C., but it's A.D., as he says, the fifth column, Hexapla of uh, that man has got the, the whole thing in the A.D. Uh, that's where it came, that's originated. So we've been lied to as far as Septuagint and quoting from Septuagint. A lot of people teach that, and we're taught in school and seminaries and schools, but as I say, uh, uh, that's a false statement. All right, uh, we're welcome, glad to welcome our host pastor, uh, Dr. Christian Spencer. He's going to be speaking to us this morning on the poetry of the King James Bible. May the Lord bless you, Dr. Spencer, as you come and speak to us. Thank you so much, Dr. Waite. And again, it is a delight to be hosting the Dean Bergen meetings this year. We had the privilege of hosting the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible here several years ago. And we're delighted that those of you who are then here are able to come back, and we are certainly glad for the new folks who are with us today. Poetry in the King James Bible. When the call to present papers was issued for the 2016 annual meeting of the Dean Bergen Society, President Dr. Waite requested that a number of the members give an analysis and a review of various sections of the book, in the beginning, A History of the King James Bible. That's written by Alistair McGrath, Oxford 2000. This paper is a response to that call and focuses on section 11 of McGrath's book, which is page 179 and following, entitled Poetry in the Bible. Since section 11 is relatively brief, the review portion of this paper will also be brief. More attention will be focused in part two on the major segments of discussion that reflect the impact of biblical poetry in six different areas. Number one, the nature of biblical Hebrew poetry, and why the King James translators were wise in not trying to translate it into the then current forms of English poetry. Number two, the contrasting nature of English language poetry in 1611. 
Number three, the elements of English poetry that make it inappropriate for translating Hebrew poetry in any literal sense into English, and thus why the criticisms of the King James Version by modern translators are not only inappropriate, but uninformed. Number four, the issues raised by having divinely inspired poetry in the Bible. Number five, the impact that the poetic sections of the authorized version have had in three different areas of study, including A, the impact these sections have had on the English language, B, the doctrinal foundation of the church in the English-speaking world as related to these poetic sections, and C, the resulting English language Bible resources And finally, part six, a summary and conclusion, restating a few possible answers to the attacks made by the critics who scorned the King James Version in favor of modern translations, which handled the poetic sections differently. So we begin with part one, a review. It should first be noted that McGrath has a very extensive list of works consulted at the end of his book, including various catalogs of additional works allowing expanded study for the serious researcher who is interested in pursuing particular fields of interest on discrete topics related to the King James Bible. A few of these intersect with the purpose of this paper in discussion between prose and poetry, and I've given you many footnotes in this paper, so when it's published, uh, you'll be able to see the footnotes if you get it from Dr. Waite. So we have a few of these, which are very important if you are studying this particular topic, and why the authorized version translators chose to translate Hebrew poetry into English prose in an English prose layout rather than translating English poetry with its emphasis on rhyme and meter in a visually identifiable English poetic style layout, although to a limited extent some of those elements are present. Those who criticize the King James Version for its, quote, failure to incorporate English poetic style are blowing a smokescreen for their own more significant failures in at least three different areas. A, they overlook the gigantic impact that the King James Version prose has had on the entire English language, English culture, idiomatic expressions, and Western civilization. Key phrases that have established what can be rightly called the worldview of both English culture and the entire Western civilization. B, They blindly ignore the focus that the King James translators had on formal equivalence and the precision with which they translated, in contrast to modern versions which systematically dilute the text with views, ideas, and interpretations of the translators who often give a paraphrase rather than a translation, and C, and this is very important, they use their criticisms to cover heretical modern translations. To a lesser extent, the impact of Hebrew idioms has a minor influence on the translator's choice to avoid the English poetic style, although McGrath gives a delightful list of 22 Hebrew idioms that have been absorbed into the prose of the English language. These include such things as to lick the dust, Psalm 72.9, sour grapes, Ezekiel 18.2, the skin of my teeth, Job 19.20, and rise and shine, Isaiah 61. Principally, the choice to truncate English poetic style when dealing with scripture is found in what might be called the translator's controlling motivational factors, including, but not limited to, a, the earnest desire of the AV translators to give precise and accurate renderings of the various Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic words and phrases, and b, the desire of the translators to focus on communicating the content of the text rather than focusing on embellishments that might tend to distract the student of scripture. And I have just a little note here on, and I'm sorry about this, on the issue of distraction. One of the more distracting items in McGrath's work is the lack of proofreading, at least in the paper-bound edition in my possession. The error with the greatest frequency appears to be his failure to space between words throughout the book, although other errors such as misspellings and nonsense words occur. McGrath rightly identifies the use of poetic style as, and this is important, so hear this sentence, he rightly identifies the use of poetic style as a disagreement that arose at the time the King James was translated, not merely a disagreement that has come with the 20th and 21st century critics. The fact that modern critics disdain the King James translators for their decision to choose a non-poetic form of typesetting their translation 
merely indicates that the critics are thinking with a modern cultural perspective rather than dealing with the underlying rationale of the scholars who did the authorized version. As McGrath notes, and as discussed below, this was not an oversight by the translators, but a reasoned and careful choice for specific and legitimate purposes, which I'll discuss in the discussion section. Quoting Sir Philip Sidney, whom he cites, McGrath shows that even at the time the A.V. was translated, there were certain misunderstandings about Hebrew poetry, which even Sidney himself, who lived at that time, admits, which the translators of the authorized version were trying to avoid with meticulous precision. In the quotation cited in footnote 10, Sidney uses several words which give striking reasons why the translators deliberately avoided the then current or in vogue poetic style of the secular culture. Sidney says that, quote, he presumes, unquote, that since the Psalms are poetic in nature, and that's true enough, of course, that, quote, therefore they are, quote, fully written in meter, unquote. Now, those of you who've studied logic know that's a very bad and large non sequitur conclusion because Sidney himself admits that, quote, the rules be not yet fully understood, unquote. If the rules are unknown and if there is no obvious meter, it should be even more obvious that it is dangerous to make up the rules just to be culturally acceptable. Further, not all English language poetry follows Shakespearean, Jacobean, or Elizabethan meter, certainly not 20th century poetry. How much less can we force the poetic expressions of 2000 BC to about 95 AD to follow the secular poetic styles at the time the King James Version was translated? The first illustration that McGrath gives of this current mindset is Paul's first letter to Timothy, where the Revised Standard Version, an ecumenical and in many places heretical translation, typesets 1 Timothy 3.14 through 4.3 in a style familiar to modern readers of poetry. The editors of the RSV are thus theoretically, quote, modernizing the text to be, quote, understandable to, quote, modern Christians by letting us know that this is an ancient hymn form that was probably sung by the early Christian church. That may or may not be true, but of course the more serious issue is that the defect, eclect, uh, the defective eclectic text used by the RSV in these very verses weakens the central doctrine of the deity of Christ. Criticizing type style and poetic appearance in the authorized version is a smokescreen to hide the subtle attack on the person of Christ. Now, hymns have always been a part of the church worship since its birth, because hymns were a large part of worship of national Israel throughout the Old Testament. As discussed below, the men of this society are familiar with the three basic elements of traditional English language poetry and its connection to music in the religious context, because we sing hymns with those three elements in our churches every Sunday. In exercising caution, rather than going with current convention, the King James translators also exercised wisdom since the rules of Hebrew poetry were not yet fully understood and imposing current rules that applied to the English of that period might have jeopardized the translation's accuracy of the text. This, of course, raises the issue of whether it is ever proper to set, for example, the Psalms to meter and rhyme in order to sing them with Western forms of music or if the psalms may only be sung with their original Eastern melodies and styles. McGrath cites Stenholm and Hopkins Psalter, and most are also familiar with the work of Isaac Watts and other Psalters, especially in the Reformed tradition. Was Watts right or wrong to give us hundreds of hymns that most in this audience have sung and still sing based on the biblical text? That discussion is outside the scope of this paper and must wait for another time and place, but perhaps one of the keys to an appropriate resolution is to observe that a formal translation of scripture and a musical expression of theology are not identical in their nature, although both are expressions of the same truths. Oriental and Western music are immensely different in multitudinous ways, and the ancient music of Israel in the Middle East has still not been adequately described or deciphered. Hebrew poetry, particularly the Psalms, is clearly tied to the Hebrew music of the Old Testament. And to date, we can only generalize and make assumptions that are based on guesswork and not a definitive fact 
as to the nature, tonal structure, notation, harmony, if any, modes, and other elements. And those of you who know something about music know there are many other parts too. McGrath notes that William Tyndale, 1494 to 1536, whose translation predated the King James Version, treated certain poetic sections as poetry distinct from prose. For example, Tyndale recognized the Magnificat as the song of Mary's praise in Luke 1 and set it out in poetic style. So it's not like the King James people didn't have any idea that you could do this. McGrath states, quote, This was an issue that the King James translators could not overlook. In the event the translators used an identical textual presentation for all literary genre within the Bible, irrespective of whether it was poetry or prose. Every biblical verse was printed out as an individual paragraph with the verse number in a type identical in size to the text itself. To give an idea of how completely this obliterates the poetic nature of the text, we shall present Psalm 23 as it is laid out in the King James Bible, unquote. McGrath then compares in contrast Psalm 23 with the prose of Romans 1 and states, quote, It was thus impossible for the reader of the King James Bible to determine whether he or she was reading prose or poetry. It is clear that the decision was taken to follow the Geneva Bible's practice of imposing verse divisions which, it must be stressed, often fail to take into account literary issues and thus destroying any visual or presentational distract distinction between verse and prose. The topographical convention thus forced upon the translators gave them little freedom in this matter and they cannot be censured for this action. Nevertheless, it remains a serious difficulty which has been intensified since the 18th century when the poetic nature of large parts of the Old Testament began to be appreciated and praised. That's why the critics are criticizing us today. One of the pressures for revision of the King James Bible in the 19th century was precisely this recognized recognition of the need to treat poetry, unquote. So he's saying they made a wise decision, but now the enemy has taken and tried to use it against us. All of this demonstrates the point that not only McGrath makes, but a point that almost all, even the most rabidly anti-KJV attack dogs, concedes. The translators of the King James Version were the most cautious and careful of all of the English version translators, certainly of that general period. Quote, even though the King James translators stated from the outset that they intended to reserve the right to offer more than one English rendering of cognate words where they believed this was appropriate, it is significant that the King James Bible remains the most cautious and conservative of the Renaissance translations in this matter. Tyndale in the Geneva Bible, for example, showed little attention to the issue of what might be termed verbal equivalence. The King James Version translators moved much closer to the notion of providing set formula for translating the more common original terms and phrases as determined by their context, unquote. Very important because their focus was on a precise and accurate translation. He goes on, It is clear that the translators of the King James Bible used a formal approach to translation which required each word of the original to be translated into its closest English equivalent. Approaches to translation can be broadly broken down into two groups. Those that place emphasis on the donor language, that is, the language in which the work was originally written, and those that give priority to issues concerning the receptor language, that is, the language into which the translation is taking place." Unquote. To support this point, McGrath gives three principles that translators of the authorized version used to inform their technical foundation for translation. Quote, a careful study of the way in which the King James Bible translates the Greek and Hebrew originals suggests that the translators felt obliged to, number one, ensure that every word in the original was rendered by an English equivalent. Number two, to make it clear when they added any words to make the sense clearer or to lead to better English syntax. These words were originally indicated in Roman type, the remainder of the biblical text being typeset in black letter type. In more recent times, they are indicated by italics, following a precedent set by the Geneva Bible in 1560. Number three, they followed the basic word order of the original whenever possible, and that's sometimes tough. Those of you who know Hebrew, a Hebrew word order is not the same as English word order. This general approach to translation can be shown to have been widespread in the late Middle Ages, unquote. 
McGrath points out that it is interesting to note that this same general, careful method of translation, had been sought out in the writings of George Chapman, who translated the seven books of the Iliad in 1598, just 13 years before the translation of the King James Bible. Quote, in his 1598 translation, Seven Books of the Iliad, George Chapman set out what he regarded as being the ideal approach to be adopted by a translator. The worth of a skillful and worthy translator is to observe the sentences, figures, and forms of speech proposed in his author, his true sense and height, and to adorn them with figures and forms of oration fitted to the original in the same tongue to which they are translated. And these things I would gladly have made the question of whatsoever my labors have deserved. Unquote. If this care was used for a secular work such as the Iliad, should not as much care have been given to the King James Version of the Bible? Of course, and it was. Thus the voices of the critics are both hollow and petty. Chapman's secular translation work was well known in the academic circles of the day, and his comments were undoubtedly influential in the minds of many, if not all, of the King James Version translators. After all, they were in fact dealing with the Word of God, not merely classical Greek literature. And they would certainly not have held to a lower standard than the contemporary secular scholarship of the day. McGrath summarizes his observations with these words, quote, the hallmarks of a translation are thus fi fidelity to the original, both in terms of content and style, mingling technical precision with an awareness of the challenges and opportunities afforded by the language into which translation was to take place. The translator of the English Renaissance was thus not merely a verbal mechanic, but one who was concerned to achieve and retain elegance in the resulting translation. Some of such understanding is found in the King James Bible, which retains the word order of the original to a remarkable extent, while still making allowances for the need of the resulting text to be, in the first place, recognizably English, and on the second, intelligible. The King James translators seem to have taken the view, which corresponds with the consensus of the day, that an accurate translation is, by and large, a literal and formal translation." Unquote. Very important. By using formal equivalence, the King James Version was used by God in a remarkable way to help shape the Western mind to think, at least initially, with a Hebraic mindset and to develop a biblical worldview that lasted for many generations of Western civilization. For this reason, McGrath notes, quote, One of the results of this important decision is that a significant number of essentially Hebrew ways of speaking became incorporated into the English language. This approach to translation has resulted in the receptor language, that's English, being enriched by the idioms drawn from the donor language, Hebrew. For this reason, the King James Bible has had a highly significant impact on the development of the English language, a matter that deserves to be considered in much greater detail." Unquote. That leads to the second division of this paper, dealing with the questions regarding principles of Hebrew poetry as compared to and contrasted with English language principles of poetry, demonstrating that the King James Version translators made the right choice to translate and set out the text for visual observation in prose as they did. Analysis and comment. Section 1. The nature of biblical poetry. Why the King James translators were wise in not attempting to translate the Bible into the then current forms of English poetry. Biblical Hebrew poetry omits some of the key structural elements of English language poetry while simultaneously erecting a different poetic scaffold with unique linguistic elements to carry the poetic ideas. Simply put, we need to recognize from the outset that biblical poetry is inspired by God who chose the exact poetic structures that are used to express his revelation as well as choosing the exact and precise words. In other words, Biblical inspiration extends to linguistic structures and forms, as well as to the words themselves. This is of particular importance when we discover, somewhat to our surprise, now I, I think this will probably surprise most of you, that between one-third and one-half of the Hebrew Old Testament is written in a Hebrew poetic style. Between one-third and one-half of your Old Testament is written in Hebrew poetic style. The exact percentage is still in question, but even the most conservative Hebrew scholars assert that a minimum of one-third of the Old Testament is poetic. 
As far as this author could determine, there is a consensus that only Haggai and Malachi contain no Hebrew poetry. A great deal of Hebrew poetry is found in the prophetic books. I think that most of the members of this society would agree that at least one third of the Old Testament is prophetic, prophecy, making it highly imperative for study in light of current world events. We see what's going on, so we study prophecy, right? One third of the Old Testament is prophetic. But how many of us have wondered why God would choose Hebrew poetic form to express at least that much of his revelation to mankind as he did when he made one third of the Old Testament poetic? That brings us to the first reason the King James Version translators chose not to translate Hebrew poetry into English poetry. There is no legitimate way that Hebrew poetic form can be literally translated into English poetic form and still retain the formal equivalence translation sought after by the King James Version translators. Simplistically stated, English poetry is in direct linguistic descent from Greek and Latin poetry, which is, quote, sound-based. There will be more discussion of that in a moment. On the other hand, Hebrew poetry is in direct linguistic descent from what has been called proto-Semitic. The cognate languages, among others, such as Canaanite and Ugaritic, which was the language of the Hittite Empire. In all of these languages, the poetic structure is, quote, thought-based rather than sound-based. This author had the privilege of taking coursework at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem comparing Ugaritic literature and biblical literature and examining some of the poetic tablets from Rosh Shamra in what is now modern Turkey. The Ugaritic poetic structures are very similar to biblical poetic structures and totally unlike any structures in English language poetry. About 140 years after the authorized version was translated, distinct progress began to be made on deciphering biblical Hebrew poetic structure. In the book, Lectures on Sacred Poetry of the Hebrews, published in 1753 by Bishop Robert Loth, demonstrating for what appears to be the first time that biblical poetry is expressed in what has been called, quote, balanced lines of thought. These balanced lines of thought come in several forms. Number one, synonymous lines in which the lines use different words to say the same thing. Number two, antithetical lines, in which each line states an opposite, or we would say a positive and a negative truth in parallel. Chiasmic lines, in which a chiasm, a very prevalent literary form used in the New Testament as well, is formed by the two lines. Chiasm comes from the Greek letter chi, which looks like an X, and the thought expressed by a chiasm takes the form AB, and the next line, BA. So that when the two lines are placed underneath each other, the A's are connected this way and the B's are connected this way and it forms an X. That's what calls, why it's called a chiasm. Number four, synthetic lines in which two or three lines expand a single thought. Another 145 years passed before the next major breakthrough in Hebrew poetic structure was established. Charles A. Briggs in his work, General Introduction to the Study of Holy Scriptures, 1899, observed further elements of Hebrew poetic structure, which he identified by the following terms. One, emblematic structure, in which one clause is literal and the second clause is metaphorical. Number two, climactic structure, in which each subsequent clause reveals truth in an ascending fashion. And three, introverted structure, in which a series of clauses, on average four clauses, but in some cases five clauses, with the first two and last revolving around the central clause, show parallels between the first and the last clause, and then the two internal lines, numbers two and three, reflect a consistent parallel. Further careful observations were made in 1915 by C.G.B. Gray in his book, The Forms of Hebrew Poetry, when he noticed that in some biblical Hebrew poetry there is what are called balanced clauses. In some cases, there is a complete balance where every word in the first line is repeated or balanced by a word in the second line. There are a few elements of Hebrew poetry that also occur in English language poetry, but they are relatively rare. These are included in some of the acrostic psalms, such as Psalm 119 and Lamentations 1 through 4, which are poems showing an alliteration of consonants, also like Isaiah 1, 18 through 26, and poems showing an assonance or play on vowels, such as Exodus chapter 14, verse 14. As in other languages, most Hebrew, po- Hebrew poems have a theme. 
The most obvious of these is perhaps the Song of Songs, we know it as the Song of Solomon, Shir Shirim, which is a love poem reflecting highly satisfying marital love as well as expressing a symbolic portrayal of the relationship between Christ and his bride, the Church. This in itself shows symbolic poetic metaphor can be grounded, and often usually is, in tangible reality, which can also be expressed in parallel in poetic form. This is also well known in English language poetry, though poetic frame and structure are different. The King James translators wisely sensed these issues, though the poetic structures were not fully developed or known at the time they did their work. As a result, they made the, listen carefully, they made the knowing and therefore the correct choice not to use the then contemporary English language poetic forms to express biblical Hebrew poetry, which would have been an unfaithful representation and thus an unfaithful translation under the standard of formal equivalency. Because Hebrew poetry does not use the same structural form used by English language poetry, the authorized version translators used the best form available for translation, which in this case was accurate prose. Without doing an exhaustive study of all the different topically related biblical Hebrew poetic expressions, the following themes have been identified. Work songs, ballads, laments, epic history poems, war songs, benedictions or blessings, curses, taunts, hymns, that's psalms, acrostic poems, and even the magical text of Balaam in Numbers 24, 3 through 9. As we see the way in which Hebrew poetry can be used and is used, to articulate so many themes, we have further insight into why God chose to use so much poetry in Scripture. Poetry is a powerful mnemonic device, regardless of the linguistic structure. Poetry is easy to remember, particularly when it is set to music. God wanted, and he still wants, his people to remember what he has taught them. This is particularly true when we see how much of the history of Israel is preserved in poetic form. For example... The narrative of Deborah and Barak in Judges 4 is written in prose, but the song of Deborah and Barak in Judges 5 is Hebrew poetry recording the exact same event. In the same way, we can compare Exodus 14. We see the narrative where Pharaoh and the Egyptians are drowned in the Red Sea. That's written in prose in chapter 14. But then we move to chapter 15, where the song of Moses describing the same event is written in Hebrew poetic form. Summary. From these observations, we can come to the conclusion that one of the major characteristics of Hebrew poetry is thought parallelism. Parallelism. There is also parallelism in English language poetry, but the structural framework, as discussed above, is different. Section 2. The contrasting nature of English language poetry in 1611. Further reasons why the King James Version translators were wise in not trying to translate the Bible into the then current forms of English poetry. The three basic elements of English language poetry in the 1600s usually included some form of, number one, a rhyming scheme. In other words, the repetition of similar sounds, usually with the convention of what is called end rhyme, or in other words, the final words at the end of each line on alternate lines, or internal rhyme, where two or more words separated by punctuation rhyme on the same line. Number two, English language poetry in the 1600s included meter, that is, regular rhythm. And number three, word sounds, or we would say alliteration. These are collectively called sound play. In English language poetry, the goal is oral public performance with emphasis on the spoken nature of the poetry, including dynamics, pauses, hand gestures, and body movement. These elements are almost completely missing in biblical Hebrew poetry. In other words, in other periods of English language poetry, some of these elements are predominant, and some periods they may also, like Hebrew, be essentially missing, as in what's called free verse, modern poetry, or unrhymed haiku poetry. Poetic form, now we're talking about form, in both biblical Hebrew and English language poetry has more in common than the formal structures discussed above. There are essentially three common types of poetic form. Number one, lyric poetry normally describing a poem expressing the thought of one speaker, though it might not necessarily be the poet himself or herself, which reveals strong emotions, thoughts, and feelings. Most English language poetry, especially love poetry, sonnets, and so on, falls into this form category, but some biblical Hebrew poetry does as well, such as we mentioned a moment ago, the Song of Songs. 
Number two, narrative poetry. Normally this refers to a poem that tells a story. It will follow either a strict historical line, such as the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, scarcely a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. Midnight ride of Paul Revere. Or, if we have a historic poetry that is fictional history, such as the cremation of Sam McGee. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge I cremated Sam McGee. You get the idea. That's not Hebrew poetry. That's not the way they do it. <laughs> Okay, that's narrative poetry. But we do have some. Narrative poetry gives the historical narrative, also traces a theme, such as redemption, as in the Song of Moses in Exodus 15. Narrative poetry usually has a plot line, specific characters, conflicts, intensifying action, climax, and a resolution. The third poetic form is what's called descriptive poetry. It normally describes the world that surrounds the speaker and expresses the world view of the speaker. An illustration of this is Psalm 19, describing the majesty of the heavens, followed by a comparison and parallel to the word of God in the second half of that psalm. This type of poetry paints beautiful, elaborate word pictures by the use of carefully crafted imagery, adjectives, allusions to things within the knowledge of the listener, and in pagan poetry, may even allude to mythical beings and creatures. Descriptive poetry can also be emotional, but it is more outward fo focused, whereas lyric poetry is more focused on the personal and introspective themes. Much of the Hebrew poetry and the prophetic writings of the Old Testament falls into this category, particularly those sections dealing with the prophetic future blessings and future judgments. Now we move to section three. Elements, and I'm running out of time. Uh, elements of English language poetry that make it inappropriate for translating biblical Hebrew poetry in any literal sense into English and thus why the poetic criticisms of the King James Version by modern translators are not only inappropriate and irrelevant, but uninformed. Of course, some poems combine elements of two or more of the three poetic elements of forms that we've just noted. Additionally, there are multiple subtypes of the three major forms listed above, including odes, that's lyric poems on a serious subject with ornate style and stanza patterns and of moderate length, then there are elegies, those are lyric poems that mourn the dead. That's not the same thing as a eulogy, by the way. Portions of Jeremiah and Ecclesiastes fit that substyle. Sonnets, a 14-line lyric poem written in iambic pentameter. The two principal kinds of sonnets are Italian and Elizabethan, or what is also called Shakespearean or English uh, sonnets. And by the way, because this is very appropriate and important for our discussion today. Shakespeare lived from 1564 to 1616, and his work was well known to the translators of the King James Version. He died just five years after the King James Version was put out. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Ballads, those are a musical narrative poem about ordinary people sung to folk tombs with simple but not complex rhythms. Epics are longer than odes and are usually orderly, dignified narrative poems in ornate ceremonial style that tell the deeds of some hero. And then, of course, you all have heard of limericks. They're very structured, easily, usually funny poems of five lines with an A-A-B-B-A -A -B -B -A, uh, rhyming pattern. Now, you say, what in the world is he talking about that crazy stuff for? I'll tell you. I'll tell you momentarily why I've included all this information on English language poetry in a paper dealing with biblical Hebrew poetry because I'm trying to show you the difference and why the King James translators did not use it. Okay, so I'll tell you in just a moment why I'm doing that. But as a legal argument, and you know I'm a lawyer too, I have to first lay a foundation. That's what I'm doing right now. For those of you who are English majors, you know that this has only been a very brief overview. 
We've chosen not to discuss the elements of poetic foot. That's the number of rhyming units in a traditional line of metered poetry. We haven't discussed irregularity in metered poems, blank verse, free verse, denotation and connotation of words used in poetry in contrast to the same words being used in poetry, which incidentally has a bearing on why the AV used prose rather than poetry, but can't be discussed here because we've got time constraints, and other technical poetic terms. But this overview will give us enough of a foundation to answer the questions we have asked. And these are the questions. Why is English poetry inappropriate for accurately translating biblical Hebrew poetry? And two, why did the authorized version translators choose to avoid English poetic forms? First, let me state the value of English language poetry including both it is totally appropriate and it has a needed place in our language, including descriptive poems about biblical events such as the destruction of Sennacherib by Lord Byron, that's George Gordon. And I'll give you just a little bit of that so you can see. What he's describing here is what is found in 2 Kings 18 and 19, 2 Chronicles 32, and Isaiah 36 through 37. He put it into English language poetic form. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. And then in six incredibly powerful and beautiful stanzas describing the annihilation of the Assyrians who surrounded Jerusalem, Lord Byron ends with these words. And the widows of Asher are loud in their wail. And the idols are broke in the temple of Baal. And the might of the Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. In my opinion, it's fully appropriate to produce poetry on a biblical subject, just as is it fully appropriate to write music on a biblical subject with biblical texts. Even great music such as Handel's Messiah or Mendelssohn's Oratorio Elijah or Bach's St. Matthew's Passion, and certainly the hymns that we sing in church every week, if theologically accurate and set to Christ-honoring music, they're fully appropriate. But it would have been totally inappropriate to try to translate the Hebrew poetic text into English language poetry in the King James Bible. If that's the case, we have to ask the question, why? So let me illustrate. As you probably have guessed, I love English language poetry, such as, for example, Crossing the Bar by Alfred Lord Tennyson. That poem expresses an incredible soul-moving desire for heaven, a desire to see our Savior. I memorized it and have quoted it to myself many, many times since my dear wife Judy fell asleep in the arms of Jesus. Sunset and evening star and one clear call for me and let there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea but such a tide as moving seems asleep too full for sound and foam when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again Home. Twilight. And evening bell. And after that, the dark. And let there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out our bourne of time and place, the flood may bear me far. I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed 
the bar. It's beautiful. It expresses incredible truths about death and heaven. But it is a poem, not a translation of Scripture. Poetry is a compact way of stating deep truth that reaches not only the mind, but also the emotions with poignant, graceful, and precise language. That is the reason that so many of the great and lasting hymns have such a powerful impact on the hearers. They express biblical truth with language that is not only appropriate, but also with powerful, appropriate musical forms that cement the language inside the soul of the listener. That is also why some of the great hymns of the faith have lasted for centuries, and why contemporary Christian music is generally rubbish and usually becomes obsolete within a few years of its composition. However, God did not choose to use the elements, form, or structure of English language poetry to any great extent in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. But that being said, we must note one thing that is true both in biblical Hebrew poetry and the poetry of most languages and cultures. Poetry is often difficult because poetic language is frequently indirect, veiled in allegory, compact, terse, uniquely combines things that we normally never blend or associate together, and simultaneously moves our emotions as well as our minds. That's why many Americans choose not to read or really study and analyze the poetic sections of scripture, or poetry in general, because it takes work to understand it. The lazy reader prefers to have everything fed to him like baby food. He avoids poetry because it demands that he exert energy and hard thought to understand it. The Apostle Paul speaks of some portions of Scripture as milk and other portions as meat. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. A great deal of the poetic sections of Scripture are difficult and fall into the category of meat rather than milk, particularly the poetic sections of the Old Testament prophets. Now, why have I gone on, and I hear I have three minutes here, uh, to some pains to outline English language, poetic structure, form, content, and elements, discussing how the authorized version translators handed biblical Hebrew poetry. There are at least three essential reasons that were required in this analysis. Number one, there are striking differences that cannot be adequately reconciled. Translating biblical Hebrew poetry into Shakespearean poetic form by the formal equivalence method. Formal equivalence produces the best, most accurate, and most faithful translation, which was the goal of the King James Version translators. Shakespearean English language poetry would not have accomplished that goal in 1611. Number two, the translators were translators, not poets. The King James Version was made at the pinnacle of the most exquisite English language poetry yet penned, when the greatest English poet to that date, Shakespeare, and possibly the greatest English poet who ever lived, was still alive. To try to place difficult Hebrew poetry into English language poetry without knowing the rules of Hebrew poetry would have been both arrogant and absurd. Certainly without being great poets themselves, the translators would have been scorned in a world that was familiar with the great bard. In that case, the authorized version would have been relegated to a back room, also ran shelf of mediocre translations. We're still uncovering and learning the rules of biblical Hebrew poetry even today. For example, God gave different gifts and different talents to different men. God gave incredible musical gifts to Mendelssohn, who was writing exquisite symphonies by the age of 12. God gave brilliant writing and poetic skills to Shakespeare. He gave brilliant translation skills to the King James translators. Simply put, although different art forms can be knit together with soul-pleasing delight, poetry and music trans and translation are not the same gift in the natural realm, just like apostolic gifts of healing and miracles are not the same gift as pastor-teacher. Number three, bad poetry. The modern translators who try to make English language poetry translations equivalent to biblical Hebrew poetry need to make a choice. Are they going to be a faithful, accurate, precise translator, or are they going to be very bad poets proudly waving their poetic rags in public? Some of the modern translators have obviously chosen to be very bad poets. I'm out of time, I think. How much time have I got? One minute. Okay, here we go, quick. The issues raised by having divinely inspired poetry in the Bible. Why did God use so much Hebrew poetry in the Bible, especially since it's so hard to translate into other languages? We've alluded to several. First, God expects us to energetically study his word and to teach it that way. You guys who are pastors do it. I'm not going to read the rest of that. Second, certain portions of scripture are called milk, easy to digest, others are meat. 
English prose translates those sections better than English poetry could do. Third, poetic structure, form, and elements communicate truth in a unique way, just as looking at a diamond from different angles and under different lights bring out its great beauty. English language poetry cannot adequately reflect the grouping of insights and remain formal, faithful to formal equivalency, but English prose can. Fourth, God clearly wants us to view the biblical Hebrew poetic sections as being equal in value to the pro prophetic sections of Scripture, since he de dedicated as much, if not more, space to expressing himself in poetry. So we need to spend time, guys, on studying biblical poetry. Fifth, and I love this one, Hebrew poetry gives a beautiful insight into the nature and character of God. Clearly, God is not only a musical being in Scripture, but he is a beautiful poetic being as well. The extensive use of Hebrew poetry in the Old Testament reveals this in an astounding matter. Sixth, by divine command, Scripture is to be translated into all the languages of the earth, not just English. Each language has a different linguistic structure, though some are similar. Just as there are certain conventions in English that make prose the best form for translating Hebrew poetry, you may have to achieve a formal equivalency in other languages. I, I can't go on with that. Seventh, and this is the last one, uh, God gave Hebrew Old Testament, including the poetic section, to the Jews and through the Jews to the church today. But he gave it to ancient Israel in the venue, language, culture, and linguistic forms that most perfectly expressed himself to those people. We must go back and learn what God said to them rather than trying to force fit his revelation into a shape pleasing to carnal American Christians today. God gave major portions of the Old Testament in poetic form because poetry is generally, as I said, a potent tool for memorization and God wanted them and us to learn his word. And I've given some illustrations. And then you have to, if you want to know what the last page says, you have to get the book and read it. <laughs> oh yes, the scripture reading. Thank you, Dr. Waite. I moved fast, but not fast enough. All right, let's stand and read together Psalm 119, verses 57 through 64. Psalm 119, and we'll read it together, verses 57 through 64. Chet. Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. The bands of the wicked have robbed me, but I have not forgotten thy law. At midnight I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. I am in the canyon of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. The earth, O oh Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. Amen and amen. Here is the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. Thank you, Dr. Spencer. Appreciate that good word. Let's open our hymnals now to hymn number 255. 255, He Hideth My Soul. Before we sing, just want to mention those that are listening to us, uh, give us uh, questions if you wish. Simply write us questions at bftbc.org questions at bftbc.org I forgot to announce that earlier so I want everybody out there in the internet land to write us if you can 255 he hideth my soul a wonderful savior Our church's missionaries, uh, Dr. Jack Mormon, uh, listened to every one of these messages that he gave to us. And he says, what would happen, what would matter if ten different questions 
What would it matter if? It talks about the Bible. It talks about having the right Bible. So I hope you'll pay close attention. He's one of our executive committee members of our Dean Bergen Society. Uh, he's from England. I said Australia. He's from England. Uh, Jack Mormon. Go right ahead. And so we do really want to know that we are passing out the, the very words of God. And of course, uh, we do have a number of Bibles today. You may not have realized that, but uh, you go into a Christian bookshop and you'll see a number of Bibles uh, advertised there. And a number of the Bibles have the word standard in it. Uh, you can get the, the new revised standard version. You can get the New American Standard Version. You can get the ESV, the English Standard Version. And of course we believe everything they tell us and the publishers said it's a standard and uh, they don't tell us that it's a revision of a previous standard. It used to be the Revised Standard Version, now it's the New Revised Standard Version. And the New American Standard Version is really the New New American Standard Version. And uh, that was a revision of the American Standard Version that came out quite some time ago. And of course it just came out and before they knew it was going to be a standard version or not, uh, they did put on, uh, they published it as the English Standard Version. Uh, time would tell, though. Time would tell. And we do have a Bible that it has been a, a, a standard version, and for about 400 years. And so we're going to uh, look at this look at this matter today. Now, uh, there's many uh, areas of this that are complex, but the basics are really quite straightforward. And uh, it's, not, it's not so difficult. It's not so difficult. Uh, we, we would say to you, keep a couple of things in mind as we go through this uh, study today. Number one, the New Testament of modern Bibles are generally shorter. So they're shorter. The, with, a, what, with one exception, there is, a, there is a Bible that's fuller and longer than the King James Bible. There's one Bible that's longer and shorter. I don't know what... It's the LSV edition. I don't know if anyone here has an LSV edition. It is longer. It's... Uh, maybe you've seen it. Uh, my wife has one. And she... Uh, and I've, some of the ladies in our church has one. It's actually the, the ladies standard version. And when I carry Dot's Bible to church, I notice it's always so much fuller than mine. She has her Bible study notes in it. Uh, she has poems in it. Uh, she has the, 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 the uh, uh, grandchildren in it. Uh, she has uh, uh, there's some recipes in it and uh, I have noticed uh, a number of the ladies in our church have an LSV edition but, but apart from the LSV edition uh, this Bible is longer it's, 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 it's and we'll explain that in just a moment so the modern Bibles in their underlying Greek New Testament text tend to be shorter and yet in the translation they tend to be somewhat wordier or with more syllables not quite as direct so they can be longer and yet shorter and then keep in mind that the reason for the issue today will hark back to two very old manuscripts. We'll be making reference to them. The fact that there is such a difference in the New Testament harks back to two manuscripts, uh, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, and these uh, were uh, written around 350 or 60 AD. So keep that in mind. Shorter, 
longer, wordier. These two manuscripts keep another thing in mind. God has promised that He would preserve His words. There are almost as many passages in the Bible, and we'll give them to you here, dealing with the matter of God preserving His words as the fact that they are, in fact, inspired of Him. They were inspired verbally, not merely the thought. Isaiah, put it in your own words, not that at all. He gave Isaiah the very words. They were inspired verbally, and they have been preserved verbally. So much so that we can say, as we've already made reference to Matthew chapter 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. We're going to begin today just uh, with an overview, and I, uh, in presenting this, this is the, the best way I have known to present it. If you've heard this, I got Stuart there. He, he Stuart could probably, if if something happens to me, Stuart could probably come up here and take over. So you know uh, uh, that that has happened while I've been uh, uh, speaking. And so we'll wait for you, Stuart. But try to do a good job if you uh, do your best. Do your best. Do your best. Don't do. But anyway, anyway, this is a big issue, and I know. For everything that we learn, there's a learning curve. I didn't understand this to begin with. I began memorizing verses as soon as I was converted. I would suggest to you, memorize verses. If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him. And we will make our abode with him. And we want him to make his abode with us. And we want to keep his words. We really do. And so that's uh, John 14, 23. And memorize scripture. Start doing it younger. When you're younger, it's somehow how some a bit easier when you're younger. I can't quite figure out the reason, but it is. It is. Do it when you're younger. As we get on, we never forget. But we just don't always remember. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, but start early. Start early. But uh, as we as we look at this, I'm going to give you ten. Would it matters? Ten. Would it matters? In introducing this subject this morning. Number one. Would it matter if the underlying Greek text, the New Testament? originally written in Greek, the Old Testament, originally written in Hebrew. We're dealing primarily with the New Testament text this morning. But would it matter if the underlying Greek text of your modern Bible is shorter? It's shorter. It does not have as many words. How do you know? Back in the pre-computer age, 1985, in our Bible Institute in Johannesburg, we counted them. And uh, that's how. You know, we just counted them. And uh, book by book, and we made it kind of a project for our students. And so we compared the Greek underlying our King James Bible, the Greek underlying the modern Bibles. It's shorter. How much shorter is it? It's shorter by 2,900 words. How many is 2,900? Let's turn to uh, First Peter. Turn to First Peter. Look at First Peter, Chapter One. And look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and 1 Peter chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5 and 2 Peter chapter 1 This is complicated now. And 2 Peter chapter 2 and 2 Peter chapter 3. 
Now that's about 2,900 words, at least in its underlying text. And then you scatter those through the New Testament, from Matthew to Revelation. So that's how much shorter the underlying text is of these so-called standard Bibles, the English Standard Version, Revised Standard Version, New American Standard Version, NIV. Uh, That's how much shorter they are in their underlying Greek text. Why are they shorter? Because they reflect these two old manuscripts that were brought to bear upon uh, Bible translation in the late 1880s. We'll make more reference to that. So, they're shorter. Would it matter if in addition to being shorter, there's about 8,000 differences between the Greek text, and I'm talking here about the New Testament, we're not dealing with the Old Testament, the Greek text based on these two manuscripts underlying the modern version and the Greek text underlying the King James Version. 8,000. You say, how do you know? We counted them. We counted them. We counted them actually in the pre-computer days, but we did count them. And uh, people say, well, uh, uh, one of the proponents of the modern Bible said there's really not that big of an issue. Uh, All of the differences could be put on one page. Yes, they could all be put on one page. If you write small enough, (laughs) and if the page is big enough. (laughs) But there's 8,000 differences. And I've got them all here. It's, it's, uh, you know, we've got them all, and uh, they're all here. They're all here. There's 8,000 thousand differences. Now it can be a difference in a word, an alteration of different words, it can be a a subtraction, it can be in a few cases an addition, Uh, but 8,000 differences, they're all here. So would it matter? That's our second, would it matter? Would it matter? (laughs) Number three, would it matter if key doctrines are not as clearly stated in the modern Bibles. Would it matter if Ephesians 3 verse 9 says God created all things by Jesus Christ? But Jesus Christ is missing in the modern Bibles because of these two old manuscripts. Would it matter if 1 Corinthians 15 47 the second man is the Lord from heaven? Lord is missing in the second uh, in the modern Bibles. Would it matter if First Timothy chapter three verse sixteen says, "And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, has been changed to He was manifest in the flesh." Well, we know He was, but was He God? First Timothy three sixteen. And there are many examples like that. And of course the, the example that we've often used, as you fly across the Atlantic, uh, these airplanes have three engines. And it's very comforting. And they say, well, you can find the Trinity in the, in the uh, New American Standard Bible. Of course you can. You can find it in the uh, NIV. Certainly. You'll have to look a little bit harder for it then. And it is comforting also to know that on these airplanes that cross the Atlantic, uh, they have maybe three engines or four engines, but they can fly on only one. But if you don't mind, let's have all four. <laughs> let's really have all four. Let's keep all four. And so we want all of it. We want all of it. We don't want... So that's our third, would it matter? Would it matter? Number four, would it matter if, for example, the word hell has been 
completely taken out of the NIV Old Testament and reduced substantially in the New Testament. Now this is more of an issue of the uh, philosophy of the translator. This is not really a, a, a textual issue, but I, I want to see where you're see where you're going. That we people do not like the thought. They don't mind using hell in their vocabulary, but they don't seem to want it quite so directly stated in their Bible. And so what will we do? Well, we'll take it completely out of the Old Testament and the NIV. We'll change it to the Hebrew or the Greek word, Sheol or Hades, which certainly isn't going to offend the, the man who gets drunk and beats his wife that he might go to Sheol, but if he, you tell him that he's going to hell, that's a bit different. We know what hell means. We don't know what Sheol means. And so, uh, that is, would it matter if in Psalm 9.17 the wicked shall be turned into hell has been changed to the wicked return to the grave? NIV. The wicked return to the grave. I mean, I've forgotten their names. These people that knock on your doors uh, with a briefcase and they want to sell you something or not to give you... Joe, yeah, uh, uh, that would make them rejoice. That's like the New World translation. <coughs> would it matter if if uh, Psalms eighty six verse thirteen, Thou hast uh, delivered my soul from the lowest hell, has been changed to in the NIV, You have delivered my soul from the depths of the grave. Big difference. Big difference. The fifth, would it matter? Would it matter if uh, the uh, names of Christ have been are, are have been removed from the modern Bibles? For example, in the NIV, they've been removed 176 times. In the New American Standard Bible, generally considered to be a more conservative of the uh, Bible they've been removed 214 times. 214 fewer instances. Let's pursue this a little bit. Would, you, would it matter, and I'll take five and six together, would it matter if these missing names frequently result in a disassociation of the name Jesus from Christ in other words it would just be Christ or Jesus but it wouldn't be Jesus Christ the name Jesus from a statement of deity the name Jesus from uh, a miracle in other words Jesus has been this, in, in this removal of names, there are 88 instances where Jesus has been removed from Christ, from a miracle, or from a statement of deity. And we'll take 5, 6, and 7 together. And our, what it matters because these are kind of interconnected. So you've got this, but let, let me just say this. In other words, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, uh, 23, it says, Jesus went about all Galilee healing, but in many of the modern Bibles, Jesus is not there. Uh, in Matthew eight twenty nine, it says, the demons cried out, Son of God, rather than Jesus, thou Son of God. So Jesus, the name above every name, Jehovah the Savior, though the name of His humanity, we know, has been disassociated. Now that's the sixth, would it matter, but that leads on into the seventh. Would, this, would it matter if this disassociation of the name Jesus uh, fits in with a five 
fivefold warning at the end of the Bible. You've got a fivefold warning we're going to look at in just a moment. I was converted, I won't tell you the year, uh, 196, well, well, I'll tell you. Anyway. <laughs> As a fellow was telling me at, at the church, he said, my mother never wants to never wants to know how old she is and he kept going on and I said by the way how old is your mother and uh, but so uh, but 1964 I was converted my wife and I had been married only a couple of months uh, we were married on a very a date that just about everyone remembers we were married November the 22nd 1963 Dallas Texas that's when the president was assassinated that's the day we were married and uh, Dot and I, we've had from that was that was our start, and I was converted shortly after that. And uh, but February, and but I began immediately reading the Bible, and just read it and read it and read it, and I tried to start memorizing, it. and almost immediately just keep reading it, and I got this idea: I'm going to try and read the New Testament through once a week. Well, that didn't work. It really didn't. But you know a young Christian, and we do want to read it, but we want to be reasonable about, about reading it. And Dot would say, why are you up so late on Friday, a Saturday night? And I said, I still haven't read to the end of the Bible. And But as I would read to the end, I would come to 1 John. And in 1 John, there is a five-fold warning but I was reading it so quick because I had to get to the end, start Monday morning, or start Sunday morning, start reading the Bible through again. So don't try to do the New Testament through once a week. But do have a regular Bible reading schedule. And read it, and read it, and read it, and read it. And a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4 verse 4 Thy words were found and I did eat them and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart Jeremiah 15 16 make much of the Bible much of, but be reasonable don't read it too slow don't read it too fast but read it. keep reading read the Bible but at the end of the New Testament, there's a fivefold warning. Let's turn to this. In 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2, and if you uh, would like to just put a 1, 2, 3 beside these verses, it, it will help you make reference to it. We've got a five-fold warning. 1 John chapter, five, uh, chapter 2 and verse 22. It says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? You see that disassociation there. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So, doesn't everyone believe that Jesus is the Christ? Well, here's a warning uh, that would indicate not. Uh, look at, uh, uh, look at uh, let me see here. Uh, look at uh, chapter 4, verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Doesn't everyone believe? Obviously not. Look at chapter 5 and verse 1. This is our third warning. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Jesus is the Christ. Chapter 5, verse 5. This is the fourth one. At the end of the verse, uh, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God, I'm sorry, let's read the entire, who is he that overcometh? The world. But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son 
of God. And then 2 John verse 7 to complete the fivefold warning. For many uh, deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. The most basic and earliest heresy regarding the person of Christ has been called a number of things, but one of them is adoptionism. And the heresy was went along this line. A very godly Jewish man by the name of Jesus lived an exemplary life in Israel at a crucial uh, crisis in his life. He was baptized. He received the Christ Spirit. He became Christ. He wasn't born Christ. He was born Jesus of Nazareth. But he received the Christ Spirit. And he became Christ. He then died. He was martyred. And the Christ Spirit returned to heaven. Now that is adoptionism. That is disassociating Jesus from Christ. Years ago, I, I, I would go to the Birmingham, I do, do some writing, and I would go to the Birmingham <coughs> Library, and I, I think I, in that, those years, it was on the fourth or fifth, they had the theological books, and if you could live through some of that, uh, amazing, but uh, I w- was on the fourth uh, story, uh, fourth floor, and they had some new books advertised. And I, I don't remember the exact title, but one book that was just come had just come into the Birmingham Library was when Jesus became the Christ. Now that's not the exact title, but that's basically what it was saying. And I took it up, took it up, and leaped through it, and it is this very heresy. It's the old heresy, the Christ Spirit came upon Jesus. In these two old manuscripts that underlie modern versions, you have this heresy. We're going to be giving you uh, as a take home, and we're going to leap through this in the second half of my presentation, missing in modern Bibles, the old heresy revived. They're missing. They're missing. So, would it matter? Would it matter? Number six, wouldn't it be so easy? Wouldn't it be so much better if we didn't have the these and thous? Really? Oh, that's so hard. That is so difficult. Would it matter if the these and the thous are not there? Well, let me mention just one aspect of that. Turn with me in your Bible to Luke chapter 20, Luke chapter 20, uh, 22. Luke chapter 22. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. Luke 22. 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that, that, that your faith fail not, and when you are converted, no, we'll, let's read that again. And I have prayed for thee. Why do we have to go from you to thee? Why not just keep it simple and just keep the use right there? Why do we suddenly 
go to older English. Thee. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Here it is. Most languages, you distinguish between the plural and the singular pronoun. In older English, the wise are all plural. You, ye, all plural. The tees, thee, thou, are all singular. Now you have this many times. And it's so important. Right at the very beginning of the Bible, you would never guess that uh, Christ, uh, that uh, Satan is also speaking to Adam. Except in the King James Bible, you have the distinguishing pronouns. Simon, Simon. We'll look at this man right here. Uh, uh, Satan has desired to have you. So he was looking at Simon, but by looking at Simon, all of the disciples. So he's addressing that, but by using the plural, you, all of the disciples are in danger. It's not just Simon. They're all. And the, the plural pronoun shows that. It's plural in Greek. It ought to be plural in English. It used to be the Y's are all plural. The T's are all singular. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But Simon, you're the one in most trouble. And I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. You need the these and the thous. There's a reverence issue too. And more could be said about that. Would it matter if it's shorter in the underlying text, but wordier? In other words, more syllables. Let me give you an example from the more uh, from the New American Standard Bible. And here, there's no underlying Greek issue. It's just that when they translated, they added more words. And I discovered, I began memorizing out of the King James. But I was told the modern versions are so much easier. And we can now go, and the New American Standard had just come out in the New Testament, and it would be very wise uh, even to to go to the trouble of re-memorizing my King James Version version, and get them out of the New American Standard. And all I can say is it gave me a headache. I tried it, and I kept, uh, back in those days, I said, you know, I know this is easier because they told me so and uh, I'm working at it and I'm really working at it and I'm trying to memorize these verses now and I battled and battled and I found I can't and when you go to the modern Bible for some reason memory uh, memorization goes out the window Uh, we had this uh, encounter with James White. Some of you might have seen it. I wish I could have done a better job because I had the easier job. To defend the King James is much easier than to defend the modern Bibles. Much easier. The best question on that encounter, I had it in my notes, but it wasn't it was asked off camera. The question was not even asked by me. It was asked by my wife after the cameras were off. And she went up and we thanked the Lord for our wife. She said, Mr. White, which Bible do you memorize out of? Off camera, he said, King James. 
Now I wonder why that is. Why is that? Why is that? And so, uh, it's easier. It's more direct. But let me give you an example here. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 41. Watch and pray. Now isn't that difficult? Isn't that hard to understand? That becomes much easier. We'll add I and G's here. Keep watching and praying. We go from three syllables to six syllables. Seek is the one word. It's translated with five words in the uh, New American Standard. You are seeking. So we go from one to five syllables. Stand forth. Two syllables becomes rise and come forward. Five. We're amazed. Three syllables becomes astonishment had gripped them. Seven syllables. Luke 6 verse 8. Their thoughts. Two syllables becomes what they were thinking. Five syllables. We know what they were thinking. We know their thoughts. Who touched me? Three syllables. Becomes who is the one who touched me? Seven, seven syllables. Now you've got to add all of this to your memorization. John 19.3 The soldiers said, the word said, in the King James 19.3 John is one syllable becomes they began to come up to him and say. Now that's all translated from the one word. That's ten. We go from one syllable to ten. Goes on. John 18.21 Ask them which heard me. Five syllables becomes question those who have heard what I spoke to them. We go from 5 to 11. Have you any meat? And we understand meat being an old English term for all kinds of food. Have you any meat? Four, four, five syllables becomes you do not have any fish, do you? Nine syllables. Revelation 15.1 Angels having the seven last plagues, nine syllables, becomes angels who had seven plagues, which are the last. And that's, uh, that rises to eleven syllables. I had to add this one. Sorry. Five words, five syllables, law of leprosy, in, in the NIV becomes in Leviticus chapter 14 verse 2 law of leprosy becomes regulations for infectious skin diseases and mildew <laughs> really makes up and then this has nothing to do with it but I had to add this the Bible says beware of leaven NIV Matt Mark 8 15 says beware beware of the leaven of the Pharisees becomes beware of the yeast of the Pharisees sorry so would it matter would it matter it's wordier but yet based on a shorter text would it matter if that one who came to Bethlehem's manger had an origin. Would it matter if Micah 5 verse 2 and this shows something of the philosophy of the translator. Matthew, Micah 5 verse 2 But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, 
Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that shall be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Would it matter if goings forth is changed to whose origin, from goings forth to origin, and from everlasting to ancient days, whose origin is of ancient days. Now that is quite a, a reversal. Would it matter that in more places than we could possibly be comfortable about, it seems that messianic prophecy has been chipped away at? For example, uh, in Matthew chapter, in, in Psalm 22, verse 16, the classic passage, they pierced my hands and my feet. A thousand years before Christ came, we knew something about His death. It would be a, a manner uh, of death not known before. It wouldn't be stoning. But uh, pretty much on cue, in some of the modern Bibles, if you look at these great messianic prophecies, if it if it if it translates it correctly, yet you go to the footnotes, and there will be something there diminishing it. And so here it says in the NIV, some Hebrew manuscripts rather than pierced will simply say like a lion, like a lion. Would it matter? Would it matter? Uh, the classic one, of course, is uh, and by the way. Nebuchadnezzar was introduced to Christ in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel. And when he came to chapter 3, he had already had some introduction to Christ. And it wouldn't matter if, if, if in, in Daniel chapter 3 verse 21, 25, uh, uh, in, the midst of the, in the midst was one like the Son of God one like the Son of God becomes, I see four men loose and the fourth looks like a Son of the Gods. So we're going to change Son of God to Son of the Gods. And so would it matter if Messianic prophecy seems to be not so focused, not so clear, if not in the text, at least in the footnotes in the modern Bibles. Would it matter? Would it matter? And so, here is just uh, an introduction. There is a case to be made for staying with the old King James Bible. Thank you. One nineteen, starting in verse sixty-five. Teth, thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Brother Brumblatt. Let's turn in our hymnals once again to number 255. He hideth my soul. 
255. He hides his mind. Ready? I'd like to tell those people that have questions for us out on the internet, just give us a, a call or an email at questions at bftbc.org. Questions at bftbc.org. Uh, the statements that difference in the Hebrew text. We didn't know the verses last uh, last session, but Job 13:15. Is the verse that Dr. DeVitra gave to us. That shows a difference in the Hebrew text of Ben Asher versus Ben Chaim. And the verse of Isaiah 9, verse 3, the word not. So those are the two verses that are there. <laughs> we heard from another person up in uh, Wisconsin, Wendy Kosek. She said uh, this was morning was wow with the first two speakers, William Shepard and Christian, speaker, uh, Christian Spencer, and now listening to Dr. Jack Mormon. I'm so thankful that I can listen to the message, but I will have to listen again to all these wonderful messages as I am so thankful, as, as when you are at home, you have interruptions. Thank you for all your hard work that you have put in with these messages. Thank you for us who have the privilege of, to listen to all of these men. Thank you in Christ for Kosex. Then Pastor Dan has given us the statistics of those listening during the morning session. And 16, we're connected with the Bible for today.org. We have three different sources for listening over the Internet. 16 on the Bible for today.org. 15 connections were from the United States. One connection from Brazil. Listening to us in Brazil. Then YouTube, there were seven uh, listening at eight different views. Uh, Sermon Audio, 39 were tuning in at some point, with 12 being the greatest number that watched simultaneously. Therefore, we estimate that between 30 and 40 people were listening online to this morning session. So this is praise the Lord for that. All right, we have some time for questions and answers uh, before our lunch takes place. And so uh, who's got the first question? From 11.20 to about 12 noon. And then at 12 noon, we'll have all the executive committee advisory council to come up in the balcony here, uh, the choir loft. We're going to take a picture, the executive committee, the Dean Bergen Society, advisory council. So when we finish question and answers, We'll come up here and take a picture before lunch. All right, who's got the first question? Yes, sir, come right up. And by the way, we may have to flip on that microphone and turn it off, I think, didn't we? Is it on? Okay, Rob will turn that goes on. That's on good. Thank you. That's live? Oh, good. Thanks a lot. Okay, go right ahead. Yeah. Okay, very good. Brethren, who's got the answers? Executive Committee, Advisory Council, or other brethren? Pastor Dan? All right, he's coming up. It's a good question. The rest of you get your questions ready. We have some time on questions. I cited it yesterday, uh, not, not the record, but indirectly, 
King James? New King James, you say by. They say with. Pardon me. King yes. James says with. Yeah. <laughs> King James says by. I have it in front of me. Yes. New King James, New King James will say with. With. Except right. those other three or four you've uh, cited, don't you say? Right. As well. All right, so they can't always trust. All right, Dr. Dimitro, right ahead. Yes, sir. Dr. Grum, Brother Grumblad. And then you have another question after that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Brother Grumblad is going to answer this, and Ed, you have a comment or question. Okay. In regard to the New King James Bible, some would say it's probably one of the better of the modern translations. I would say it's one of the worst. And the reason being, the very corrupt ones stand out as very corrupt. If I'm going to make counterfeit money, I would not make $3 triangular pink bills. I want to make it as close to the original as I can make it to fool people and be deceptive. And Satan is a master of deception. So he will give you a Bible that's so close to the original that you think it's harmless in the footnotes and in notes right within the text. They delineate and deviate and tell you the best manuscripts do not contain these verses. That's a lie. Yes. And it's very dangerous. So the New King James Bible is very corrupt and very dangerous, even more so than some of the obvious ones. That's good. Did you have a question, Brother Ed, or a comment? Well, go ahead, come. Go ahead. That's good. Brother Ed Smith, one of our advisory council members. I'd just like to make a comment about the New King James. Um, something that Dr. Mormon had mentioned was, does it matter if you delete names? And so the interesting thing is he's written a book where there's 8,000 differences. So you don't have to do the research to find those 8,000 differences. He's already done that. What you can do is read that book, and you can reference what he's already done to make sure it's correct. And if you're okay with taking the word blood out of the Bible, if you're okay with taking the word God out of the Bible, or the Lord out of the Bible, or hell out of the Bible, you'll love the New King James Version. And the other thing we mentioned earlier was that the Ben Kaim, the Ben Asher, the Ben Kaim is from the, new, is from the uh, received text that we uh, would enjoy. The Ben Asher is the uh, Old Testament that's in the New King James. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is when you go to a bookstore and you find it hard to find a King James Bible, and there's all these other different versions, it's not because of the way that they want to present the gospel in a different way. It's because of the way they want to market a Bible. And if you're going to market a Bible by the name of the New King James, then there has to be a significant amount of difference between that and the King James in order for you to copyright it. The, New, the King James Version is not a copyrighted Bible. But if you look through every other version, they're copyrighted, and it's so they can make money. That's their, that's their bottom line. 
Amen. Very good. Uh, any other comments on the New King James and other versions? Uh, I'd just simply say on these versions, I made a study of uh, three of them, Genesis to Revelation. Uh, I took the ones from the New International Version. 5, 000, I gave 6,000 different changes, additions, subtraction of changes, and I stopped counting. Some 6,000 differences, Genesis to Revelation, with the Hebrew text or the Greek text, I stopped. I went from the New American Standard Version, Genesis to Revelation. I have that study also, 4,000 differences, addition, subtraction of changes. I went through the same for the New King James, uh, over 2,000 additions, subtraction of changes. Now, uh, 2,000 is not as bad as 4,000 or 6,000, but 2,000 is still way, way too many additions, subtractions, or changes. And as the man said, it's more dangerous because it's called the New King James Version. It's got the name King James in it to fool people in order to get the thing wrong. All right, other questions? Questions from the group? Or further comments on these questions? Yes, sir. Here comes a man. Come right up to the microphone. And there's two men, two people. One over here and one over there. Okay. Uh, whoever gets here first. Dr. Eh? White, Brian Shepard from Garland. Yes, sir. Advisory councilman. Um, we live in a soundbite world. And uh, when you encounter the man at church or an acquaintance that goes to another church, uh, might be a better example that wonders why we stand so strongly on this issue of the importance of which text is the best text and that, you know, a lot of people say, what difference does it make? Uh, I'd be curious maybe to hear a few thoughts on uh, the soundbite response to that. One or two, three sentences that people will use to respond to uh, that question because to really explain it takes some time. Amen. All right, who's got some answers to that question? Here, back to Demetrius. Go ahead. I, I, got, I got two answers for the show. One is, if it doesn't make a difference, why are you using the King James? It's that simple. But the other one is, a, a, an older couple pulled up along to a red one. And he said that, you know, drive it, and she's over on the board leaning. And next up pulls up a young couple, and I mean, there's looks like a two headed driver. And she turns to her husband and says, Honey, remember when we were like that? And he said to her, I have moved. I have moved. <laughs> All right, so, and I don't know whether we got those answers properly, but. Uh, the doctrinal differences certainly are partly they're in, involved with that, and the changes are to be, the nine eight thousand. Some of those differences are not even uh, intelligible in the English language. But as Dr. Demetrio, or rather Dr. Jack Mormon, also mentions, the 356 passages that are doctrinal in import that have to do with doctrines, Bible doctrines. These other versions do not have proper doctrine, and so that's very serious. And we'll mention that a little bit more this evening as well. Yes, sir, right ahead with a question. Actually, a comment. Comment? At the uh, end of Dr. Spencer's uh, comment on poetry, mm -hmm. uh, I thought he got to the root of the matter. The, uh, I have an heavenly father, and poetry is very interesting. You can speak as a father to a son in ways with poetry that you can't in any other way. And uh, I would like to hear more elucidation upon that particular subject because I think it really gets to the root of the matter. Mm -hmm. uh, Hebrew does indeed speak in a different way than English. And my Heavenly Father speaks in poetry in ways that he cannot possibly speak uh, in prose. And thank you for pointing that out. I, I wish there were more of Bible translation done from a filial standpoint rather than from a so-called scholastic standpoint. Thank you. All right. 
Dr. Spencer, you want to say anything and comment on that? Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you for that question. Any comment or answer to that? Yes, go ahead, Pastor. In response to Brother Shepard's question about practical use, Mm -hmm. it's, uh, to me, amazingly important when we talk with individuals. Just recently, uh, I reestablished a connection with a man by the name of Kevin. Forty years ago, I led him to Christ in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, after four months on Facebook, about two months in, I got to reacquaint. So we went to his house yesterday. Mm -hmm. He had four Bibles after all these years. And uh, hopefully he's going to be refining health for particular ways. But as we began to talk, the Lord impressed me with some certain things. One of the most important verses that I use, I I believe it's important for John 3.16. If you look at the modern Bibles, and he had an MLT sitting under two Messianic Bibles, you've got to be very careful about the Messianic movement today where they talk about the renewed covenant, basing it off of the thing. But at any rate, he had two of these kind of Hebrew-based Bibles. And he was interested in Hebrew rather than Greek. But the point that I brought up right away is that he didn't talk. I had already talked to his wife some, and my children were there in this upstate New York. It's John 3.16. I don't know how many of you are aware of it. But that's where you go right away with anybody. Now, we heard about adoptionism. That was a heresy. But you all believe it. So this was my first comment. Kevin, are you a son of God? Are you a son by faith, by the blood of Jesus Christ? And he said, well, of course. I said, well, hey, let's grab your NLT, actually, because I don't know if you're aware of it, but it totally changes the picture. And he had it all yellowed in. He got this really expensive living Bible, the NLT, for his wife and himself. And this brother was so humble and so quick. And he started reading. He said, honey, Eileen, he said, I've read this so many times in NLT, but I haven't seen it. And if you know what it says, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Now this is the doctrine of adoption. This is the doctrine in the NLT of deleting a true adoption. And I said, isn't that one of the most important things in your life? That God has loved you and adopted you into his family. And so we went through the NLT with uh, John 3.16. It's a great practical use. If somebody's got a Bible, just know. NIV says, I think, only son. Uh, ESV, I think, says one and only. Now, some say unique son. Now, that's not directly wrong because only begotten is unique. But the point in the Greek is that monogenes is not just only. He had another Hebrew, uh, English New Testament where it says only brought forth. And so, because begotten means he was generated. He was a virgin birth. And so, Jesus was born in a way we were not, but we were adopted into the family. So that's a really key evangelistic point to make when you're in the street with people who have these Bibles. Don't you want to be a son of God? In 1 John, we see much of that. And so, it's a real blessing to see Kevin after all these years. And then we dealt with Revelation 22, 1, where they take away Congress from God's throne. There's a river. It's clear as crystal. What kind of river? Every corrupt, well, almost all modern Bibles take away the word pure river. Just look to Revelation 20. There's, and so then I showed him at the end. We went to a couple other passages real briefly. And he's sitting there like this. And my son got pictures. He's like this. He's got the two Bibles. He's like, like that. You know, and he's like, oh, yeah. And you just sit there and give him a little time. And then at the end, I showed him my Greek New Testament. And I said, you know, there's a bunch of changes just in Revelation 22 alone. And on the first page of my Greek English, Interlinear Greek English, I had one change, which is only the first verse. But then the second page is like, I think it's 23 changes. Third page, about 31 changes in the Greek text. And then you see the variance on the bottom. And then the final page is about another. There's 77 changes in Revelation 22 alone in the Greek text. And he said, you know what, Roy? He said, you're making my hair stand on it. I said, yeah, that is sinister. Amen. All right, questions. Do you have back there? Any other questions? Do you have one back there, sir? Or are you standing up? Okay. Other questions? Questions or comments you might have? Yes. Go right ahead. Yes. My name is Jack Wagner. 
A lot of times we're talking about the more modern versions of the Bible, but what versions of the Bible that predate the authorized version could you in some sense give the people the order that you would prefer if, if someone had to go away from the King James for whatever reason, another Bible would suffice. Is the Geneva the better one of the, the Bibles that predate the King James Bible? Well, anybody want to answer that one? Dean Burgon, Executive Committee Men, Advisory Council Men, go right ahead. Any other answers to that question? Yes, sir. I'm right ahead, Pastor. Is that an answer or a question? Both. Both. Okay, go ahead. Because I want to answer a little bit myself after you finish. Go ahead. answer that question also as far as uh, if you don't like the King James we have some substitute there's no substitute for the King James Bible there's just none zero if you take the proper Greek text proper Hebrew text proper Aramaic text accurate translated you've got the King James Bible every other one haywire don't recommend anything else but the King James Bible in, in English uh, my the man that led me to Christ, the high school janitor, went through the fifth grade. He used and he understood the King James Bible. How can he, fifth grader, understand? Because he wasn't dumbed down like we're dumbing down our students today. They can't understand anything. See? And if you say someone, my mother's, my wife's grandmother and grandfather, they went through fifth grade, sixth grade, that's it. They used and understood the King James Bible. You tell these people they don't understand. What's hard to understand? For God so loved the world. What's difficult about that? That he gave his only begotten son, just begotten it. Whosoever, what's difficult? Should not perish but have everlasting life. So these people with their excuses, and these pastors that preach from other Bibles to make it easier for excuses, don't listen to them. Deny them. Say there's no exact substitute for the accurate translation from the proper Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek into the English. It's it. That's it. The King James Bible. Now, people hate us for this. They say, oh, you just all want the King James. Well, that's all there is. If you want the real translations, the proper Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek into the English language, the only English Bible that does that accurately is the King James Bible. Period. End of report. Other questions? Pardon that sermon. I've studied it, and that's my conviction. Other, other questions? 
We have 15 more minutes of questions. Yes, Gordy, or comments. Come right up to the microphone. Thank you. <coughs> the comment is, uh, we were at a Bible study uh, about the King James. Speak up a little louder, please. A little louder. We were at a Bible study about the King James Version, and uh, he came up with a statistic that he got all these Bibles and their reading levels. And the King James was the lowest of all these uh, even the new translations, mm -hmm. it was almost like on a fifth grade level. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the, uh, how they taught the children to read back in the day, they, all, they, they took the Bible right up and that's, that's how they read it. So, just, that's a good Yeah, very good. Fifth, fifth sixth, very good. All right, and, yes, sir, right here. Yeah, I was wondering if you could give a quick history of the trajectory of how the churches have stopped using the King James over the last, say, you know, 110 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. What denominations, how the denominational, uh, you know, pullback against and when, when most churches decided, mainstream churches, evangelical churches, how that happened over the last 120 years or whatever. Good question. Brethren, Executive Committee, Advisor Council, when did they stop using the King James Bible in the last 100 years? Anybody have the history of different... Grand district denominations and so on. No answers? <laughs> well, we know that the modernist apostate denominations went quickly to the revised standard version in the 1950s. We know that. And uh, those that followed them went to that. And of course, uh, when the other versions came out, whether it's the New American Standard, the American Standards of the 1900s, a lot of them went to that. Uh, at Dallas Theological Seminary, for example, when I went there in the 1950s, uh, they didn't use the King James. They recommended the, the 1901, the American Standard Version. That's what they recommended at school there. Uh, many of us used the King James, but as far as the, the real changes, when the New International Version came out, all the new evangelical churches went forth. The new American Standard came out. The new evangelical churches went there, and the fundamentalist churches went there. And they so, but the, in the recent days, when the English Standard Version appeared, then first is Bob Jones University. For years, they recommended the new American Standard Version, perverted as it can be, recommended it. That's what they used. Now, with the English Standard Version, that's what they recommend. They have it in their bookstores. They use it and recommend it for all fundamentalist churches. Something that changes the King James Bible, and it changes the Greek and Hebrew in some 8,000 places. Same old thing. It's just a new American, it's a regular new American standard, the uh, National Council Church's uh, Bible. Uh, the, just changed over and made a few modifications. The National Council's Bible changed over. So uh, we've got a lot of problems, 356 doctrinal differences that are there. But as far as the dates of when they did it, uh, I just think that you get the date of the New American Standard Version. That came first. First, the modernist apostates, the 1950s, with the, uh, the Revised Standard Version. The modernist went with that. And when the New American Standard came out, the New Evangelical Compromises went with that. And the New International Version, the New Evangelical Compromises, and many fundamentalists went to the, now the English Standard Version, Everybody, fundamentalist, new evangelical compromises, English standard version is it. That's about all we can say. With the date of these new versions, that's where the denominations fled from the King James Bible. Other questions? Yes, sir. Did, did, um, did anybody pay attention to uh, uh, Mr. Frank Lobston when he who developed the NASB and his, his quote was something it was a paraphrase but he said mm -hmm. I feel I, I developed this Bible I'm in, I, I supported this Bible I put it together um, I believe that there's I'm in trouble with the Lord and that I uh, there's you, how can you not see satanic deception in the NASB Bible that I helped develop yes I want to answer that about Lobson's view of the New American Standard that he was one of the editors of. That's a good statement. I think what you said is correct. He changed his mind and, and backtracked, said I want nothing to do with the New American Standard. Yes, go ahead. Pastor Rainey. Uh, in uh, addressing what uh, Frank Robinson said in his confessions, what it was, his confessions, uh, if you go back to the beginning of that, uh, Rupert Murdoch now owns the copyright. But uh, when Frank Hoxton became involved in that, and he was involved in the translation and pr 
producing of that for 20 years. Right. Invested 20 years of his life into that. Mm-hmm. But you go back and look at why he began to work on the translation in competition with the King James and it was this. The friendship of a man who was in business to make money who said, I have bought the copyright to and I want to produce a Bible because, and it was all for money and profit, and he was hired for money and profit to, to render a new translation of the Bible, not for the glory of God, not for the good of the world, not for the saving grace to be known, but for filthy lucre. And God convicted him of it, and he was man enough to confess his sin and confess himself of it. And so I'm thankful for Frank Augustine's honor, at least in admitting it. But it was for money and for uh, the, the prestige of being able to uh, be uh, aligned with it for his own gains, not only monetarily, but also for recognition. So it, it was all... Thank you, Brother Randy. Didn't know all those backgrounds. Appreciate those facts. Other questions? We have ten more minutes. Yes, back there. Yes, sir. Come right up. Brother Joshua Lee. How are we? I can understand what you're that saying. Hebrew means Hebrew original. Yeah. That letters is how. How? 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 I don't understand what you're saying. No, 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 that uh, in the Old Testament, in the, in the uh, Hebrew letters, meanings how. Pronunciation how. How? Yeah, how. But King James Bible is nothing there. Just instead of how, they translate evil. Oh. Okay. Does anybody know? Hey, ra, me ra, me ra means evil. Ra. How? How? Power. Power? Power. Okay, well, I don't understand exactly what it is, but. Anybody want to comment on that question? Someone could translate for me. From the Chinese to the English. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. Alan, have a question? <laughs> Maybe I can help clarify that just a little bit. I think she's trying to say the word power. Oh, power. Uh-huh, power. Thank you. They say power. Is that it, Brother Lee? Power? Hebrew for power? Hebrew word for power. All right. Yeah. I think he said hara. Hara? Oh, the hara. Oh, yeah, evil. The evil has the white word does not in there, but I don't know the reference he's No. Yeah, ra means evil in Hebrew. That's right, ra. Well, uh, let's. we have some uh, questions from our audience on the internet, Dr. Ken Motto again, he said, on some of the New King James packaging, they have the following statement, quote, this translation is useful if you plan on uh, migrating to a modern version. The New King James is a portal version to the modern versions like the ESV or NASV. In other words, 
If you want to change your versions, start with the New King James. It's a portal. It's a it's an open door to go into some other version. That's what he's saying. It's interesting. Then yes. Very good. All right, one more uh, question and uh, comment from the audience, the Internet. Uh, this is a man from CenturyLink customer, and the comment is there's no substitute for the King James Bible. We certainly agree with that. And then uh, I'd like to clarify something about the pictures. The photographer wants not only the Advisory Council of the King James Executive Committee pictured, but before we get the, the Executive Committee, he wants every single person in this room up in that choir loft to picture the whole crowd. So within five minutes, we're going to all adjourn from our seats and all come up here. The big picture and then just the ones that are executive committee and advisory council of the Dean Bergen Society. Uh, is that all right with everybody? I hope you can climb these stairs. If you can't, well, you have to sit down. But otherwise, we'd like to have pictures of the whole group. All right, we have time for maybe one more question or comment. Four minutes. Anybody? All right, let me ask you a question then. What is the Westcott and Nord Greek text? Why is it wrong? They weren't true believers. Or true believers, that's part of it, that's right. And what else? Oh, you got a question there? Come right in. Go ahead. And by the way, I'm Josiah Magnuson. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so, just out of uh, curiosity, uh, I'm wondering if we could get an update on uh, Dr. Gomez and the, uh, the Randall Blair Gomez. Does anybody have an uh, update on th that and how it's doing and so forth? So, I'm what, curious about that. An update on Dr. Gomez. Bible. He's got his third or fourth edition of the Spanish Bible. He's doing very well. His health is very serious. He's got a surgery coming up. August, I think it's August the 8th. He's in very bad shape. He's had already one surgery. He's very, very sickly. So pray for him, for the Gomez, Humberto Gomez. He's done an excellent job on that Spanish Bible. And uh, we have copies. We sell them. And we have some back there, I think, also on the book table. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, we have any other comments or questions that we have before we adjourn? Pastor Dan. To answer your previous question, yes. Western word, the B and L, the two primary manuscripts they use, mm -hmm. which will contradict each other over 4,000 times mm -hmm. in the Gospels alone. That's good. Very good. Thank you. Vatican Sinai manuscripts. All right. Uh, are we ready to proceed to the balcony or the uh, pulpit up here in the choir loft? All right. Let's all come up to the choir. Those that are able to walk up the steps. <laughs> I hope that's all of us.